Well, thank you for having me and uh, thanks to Maxime and Anton uh, for, for uh, Maxime and Anton was here somewhere. Oh, yes, here. Uh, thank you for organizing this wonderful event. It's a privilege to be around on such a great occasion. Um, I love this photo. It's a typical. It's cool by the way. The back is a cool Oh. Moon. <laughs> <laughs> and this is typical Samson. So. Uh, his uh, brain is always working even during other talks, so I hope that this will be inspiring to him. Um, I have to say that uh, I'm quite indebted to Samson and uh, the reason is uh, when we walk through life, we sometimes are lucky to encounter people who truly inspire us, uh, not just people from who we learn. The process of learning is very natural, smooth and logical. That should be a status quo. We, we learn all the time. Inspiration is needed when we need to break out of uh, status quo. And uh, Samson, in many ways, is anything but the status quo. So he truly inspired me throughout life to stick to my beliefs, to think uh, what I think, and sometimes against the odds or what circumstances demand. Uh, when I think about Samson, it resonates with me this famous uh, campaign by Steve Jobs of Think Differently. So it inspires you to stick to your individual values and truth. And uh, it says that this is to troublemakers, the round pegs and square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not found by rules and they have no respect to status quo. You can quote them, you can disagree with them, you can agree with them, doesn't matter. You can do anything you want, but you can't ignore them. So My thank you. Apple, yeah. My computer is not <laughs> Apple, but <laughs> My <laughs> I truly admire both of these people uh, and thank you, Samson. Really thank you. So today uh, was the day of two-dimensional theories and also QCD. So I'll try to combine both of this and this last talk. So hopefully it will be a nice culmination for, for this day. Uh, one way to motivate what I'm going to tell you is uh, just study this theory. It's a theory of gauge field and uh, coupled to spinners or quarks and some simple, most minimal representation of whatever the gauge group is. So otherwise known as QCD. Uh, I'll make the problem very simple by again putting it in two dimensions. So that will be my way to connect to other speakers from today. So we'll simplify or we'll try to tackle much, much simpler theory than four dimensional QCD. <laughs> and we'll simplify it even further by asking a uh, supersymmetric version where we could have some hints from hopefully supersymmetry. So <coughs> in two dimensions there are all kinds of supersymmetries usually labeled by two integers referring to supersymmetry in left and right sector. So here I show examples with so-called 0, 2 and 2, 2 theories which are compared quite often to in their physical behavior to four dimensional theories super QCD with n equals 1 and n equals 2 supersymmetry. In fact, going back to early work of um, Samson with Lossiev and Nekrasov, where they studied, in fact, some parallel between uh, theories uh, of 4dn equals 2 and 2d 2, 2, supersymmetry. Uh, in this part of the diagram, uh, you typically encounter holomorphic quantities such as prepotential and twisted superpotential, and that work. Uh, in fact, was in some sense predecessor of gauge beta correspondence and many, my, many other developments, in particular used by Misha Schiffman in the context of vortices, who also popularizes this idea that uh, here physics is very similar even though we go across dimensions. And here physics is very similar uh, in the sense you can expect dynamical SUSY breaking. Uh, you don't typically have moduli spaces of vacua with these amounts of supersymmetry and respectively two and four dimensions. So again, there are many similarities and uh, we'll talk more about them today. Sure, the gauge, but uh, correspondence was discovered in that paper in 1998 when we tried to do instant integral, the one of hyper integration over Higgs branch. Actually, here I was uh, referring to like freckled instantons, and, and, but it's, it's very similar, so indeed. So y when you reduce, it doesn't matter, once you reduce from 4dn equals 2 and break half of SUSY, you basically land here. And we'll use several of such reductions today. So in that sense, um, they're standing on uh, shoulders of our fathers. Why 2, 2 and not 4, 0? 
Uh, well, I'll comment on other amounts. This is just uh, like introduction because I'm saying that I'll try to make my life very easy by A, going to two dimensions and B, uh, in introducing Suzy. And honestly, I came to this uh, question in the context of two dimensional such super QCDs on various brain systems. And I needed this as an application. So I thought that this should be in textbooks. I, sh I thought that this should be solved by far. So in fact, the reason is very simple. That first of all, as far as basic physics goes, in two dimensions, uh, even abelian uh, theories can find. Simply because in 4D, if you solve Laplace equation in three spatial dimensions, you get one over R, Coulomb potential. If you do the same in one plus one dimensional system, you find linear potential. V of R is proportional to R. So you get exactly what you expect in confined theories. In fact, Schwinger, uh, we, we know this as a Schwinger effect or Schwinger mechanism or Schwinger model for uh, in, in a two-dimensional electrodynamics uh, <coughs> where he beautifully demonstrated that, that uh, this happens and you can actually solve the system in the sense of predicting the spectrum and understanding its uh, strongly coupled behavior. So this is really old and this, this uh, history uh, goes back far back, so to remind you how old it is, I put here some events that happen around the same time from that year. So in fact, the date uh, Schwinger's paper was submitted or received in a journal happens to be Monday, and the reason I know this is that uh, Sam Walton opened his first Walmart store in the state of Arkansas. This was also the year when Landau got a Nobel Prize. Uh, this was a year of Cuban Missile Crisis, as many of us no, it was uh, unfortunately the year when Merlin Monroe died of drug overdose, also during that summer around the same time. Andy Warhol uh, drew his uh, famous painting of uh, cans of uh, Campbell soup and so on. So then <coughs> it's also ancient because even in a non-abelian case, the next stage in this development uh, of two-dimensional QCDs was work of Tooft who uh, solved two-dimensional super QCD, or just QCD, with NF equals one, so with one type of flavor, and showed that it has many characteristics of four-dimensional theory we expect, in particular it has a rejet trajectory of meson states. So this was the year <coughs> of Muhammad Ali's uh, famous uh, means. Uh, Nixon introduced uh, 55 uh, speed limit uh, state, uh, in every state and then left the office over Watergate scandal. Unfortunately, this was the year when Pompidou died, but Leonardo DiCaprio was born. This was the year when uh, Charles de Gaulle Airport, which every one of us passed either on the way here or on the way out, uh, was open in the way we know it. And uh, Solzhenitsyn was arrested and uh, then expelled from Soviet Union around the time. Sirius Tower in Chicago became the tallest building. That was all of year 1974. Uh, that's actually a good one. So uh, I, I was curious about this too. What's the connection? So one is a mathematician, the other is uh, a writer or a literature expert. So what, what's the connection? So indeed, it's a good thing to uh, explore and, and I did some Googling. Um, yeah, so the history is, is, is so ancient that again, when I came to this kind of problems of solving this uh, two-dimensional theories, uh, the supersymmetry or super QCD, yes, it's a model of QCD, but I thought I should be able to find the answer in textbook. So I was really surprised that that wasn't the case. So even though the history is very ancient, the progress then was very, very slow, surprisingly. So some of the heavy lifting we had to do ourselves. So <coughs> next uh, landmark in this uh, development was around 90s, not even 80s, when we're still talking about n equals zero non-supersymmetric theories, now with a joint matter. And around the same time was a lot of confusion uh, uh, what happens if you have a joint matter. So uh, there was a little bit of progress in particular in uh, some of these papers by our colleagues who clarified whether, or tried to clarify whether it's screening, confinement, big question in various approximations such as DLCQ, numerical approximations analogous to lattice or Monte Carlo was what happens if mass of the quarks goes to zero. Uh, it's, it's really fun to read this numerical literature because there was a lot of confusion around uh, the time just before that. And uh, what they find is that in uh, theories with a joint matter, you start finding stringy-like spectrum 
uh, which is also very natural, of course. This was, in a way, precursor to many ideas CFT developments where this, of course, happens. Um, but again, uh, the, the gap is pretty big. And the reason I mentioned here I join is for two reasons. So this is not the minimal, most, not the smallest representation of matter, but it's useful if you start thinking about supersymmetrization because basically supersymmetry uh, in, requires you to introduce partners, in particular to gluons, in a joint representation. So that's very, very nice, nice thing to do. And um, then if you ask about supersymmetric theories, Despite all the interest in mirror symmetry, linear sigma models, and all this and that, it's interesting that until very recently we had very poor understanding of non-abelian dynamics with 2-2 supersymmetry. So here I mentioned just a couple of developments which happened in the range of years from 2006 to 2016. But again, it's, it's to me kind of surprising that relatively recently we started to understand quantitatively what happens in non-abelian theories. Uh, even with supersymmetry. So when we encounter this problem, uh, we needed 0-2 version, which is uh, one aspect of what I'm going to tell you about. And uh, by analogy with uh, n equals 1 theories in four dimensions, you might expect, and people did expect, that it should ex exhibit some kind of cyborg type duality, that it should have dualities relating two different theories with different gauge groups. So that's what expected, and unfortunately, that A did not exist. There was absolutely no non-abelian duality in 0-2 gauge theories as of 2013. I was totally shocked that there was no single paper, no single result on non-abelian gauge dynamics with this type of theories. And uh, after looking into this, it turned out that not only you have uh, analog of cyborg duality, it's actually a triality. So number three will be playing a very interesting role in this talk. And uh, I leave you with many questions, in particular, why certain things happen the way they are. And here I can ask, why is it triality? Where does number three come from? Can we see in simple way why it's uh, a triality? And uh, I think at a very intuitive, simple level, we still don't quite understand this. So it would be nice to understand either from brain models or otherwise. So then <coughs> I'll also talk about zero-one theories. This is uh, the most minimal amount of supersymmetry you can possibly have. Not much of a help, really. It's very close to non-supersymmetric theories. And again, until very recently, there was no single statement about non-abelian dualities about such theories. Surprisingly, despite the fact that both zero-one and zero-two supersymmetry in two dimensions is what you require for heterotic world sheet, there was very uh, minimal, uh, almost nothing on non-abelian gauge dynamics in this context. So uh, again, I'll report on some recent work with uh, Dupe and Pavel Putrov, two young uh, guys uh, who uh, were instrumental in solving these theories. So as uh, we do this, we'll in the process learn something about uh, topology of theory space and some new anomalies. Again, something I'll leave you with as a question that, that uh, uh, naturally comes out of the story, but uh, I don't have a full answer to. So there will be interplay between anomalies and dynamics of quantum field theories in various directions, which is the common theme, in fact, the name of this meeting, quantum field theories and, and anomalies. So let's start with um, basic zero two theories. If you want to build the most elementary two dimensional super QCD with zero two supersymmetry, what do you do? You start by putting uh, gauge node in this quiver notation, uh, then some number of colors, say S, U, and C. That's going to be your gauge group. And you couple it in a minimal way to matter. In two-dimensional zero-two theories, there are two types of multiplets called Fermi. These are basically chiral fermions uh, denoted by the dashed line. And uh, chiral multiplets, which have scalars in them, and right-moving fermions in my notations, and let's take, say, n, b of those. So in a quiver notation, that would be the kind of theory that you want to solve and ask, does it confine? Does it flow in the deep infrared to superconformal fixed point? Or what happens? The way I presented it uh, for generic values of these three parameters, and again, generic such theory will be specified by three numbers, number of colors, and two types of matter multiplets. Uh, for generic values, it would be anomalous, so you have to think of how to cancel the gauge anomaly. And one minimal way is to introduce uh, another set of multiplets, uh, 
here called P, which are chiral, but in anti-fundamental representation of the gauge group. So that's in some sense most economical or simplest solution to the problem. So then you get this sort of quiver diagram representing single gauge group and interacting with matter. And again, you ask a question now, okay, uh, this is simplest gauge theory, what does it do? Where does it flow? As expected, depending on ranges of these parameters, you see either supersymmetric uh, su SUSY breaking, dynamical SUSY breaking, or flow to superconformal points or some free theories in the infrared. So in that sense, it is similar to cyborg type uh, dualities and structure of n equals 1 super QCD in four dimensions. So here is a diagram because now such theories are labeled by three numbers, uh, number of colors, number of bosonic or uh, chiral multiplets, and number of Fermi multiplets. <coughs> I have to plot by choosing two of these numbers representing the axis, and then the other number will roughly set the scale of diagram. So here I plotted n color uh, versus n Fermi or flavors. And uh, some of the regions in this diagram are fairly easy to understand. For example, if you have a lot of glue in your theory, it doesn't matter what kind of theory it is, but in typical SUSY theories with small amounts of supersymmetry, you get dynamical SUSY breaking if you have too many gluons compared to matter. And that's basically what, oops, what this region represents. And uh, then if you have reasonable balance or more matter than glue, then you typically flow to something uh, with nice moduli space or superconformal dynamics in the deep infrared. So that's, that's what happens here. Moreover, something more interesting happens. Notice that this region carved out by SUSY breaking and interior is where you have some interesting non-trivial superconformal dynamics in the infrared is of a triangular shape. If you add a point at infinity, uh, then it becomes more like a triangle. In fact, you can bring this to a uh, nice symmetric form if instead of uh, emphasizing the rank of the gauge group, you actually relabel uh, these nodes and uh, pay attention to the flavor groups. You call them N1, N2, and N3. Then you notice that such basic super QCDs actually enjoy complete symmetry with respect to permutation of N1, N2, N3. So it is uh, doing something if you recompute what the rank is in terms of N1, N2, and N3, uh, then rank will be changing. So it is like cyborg duality, but it is really a triality. So, and again, question is why in two dimensions, cyborg duality is replaced by trialities? Where are these threes coming from? So again, I would love to have an intuitive answer to this question. And even though by now this has been explored from many different angles, some are present today, uh, we still don't have a simple intuitive answer. Uh, mathematically, one way to understand or prove or justify this duality uh, is the following curious fact that this duality predicts at the level of chiral algebras. Many of us know a simple fact about Grassmannians, that studying Grassmannians of k-planes in n-dimensional space is the same as studying Grassmannian of n minus k-dimensional planes in n-dimensional space. You just take orthogonal complement. So Grassmannians come <coughs> equipped with very natural bundles uh, such as tautological bundle and uh, the quotient bundle. Those exchange the role <coughs> under this uh, basic duality. But again, this is a duality, it's not a triality. So this is quite known, but what's less known is that same bundles and same Grassmannians actually do enjoy triality, and that's what such models predict. Namely, if you take some combination, certain combo of this quotient bundle and tautological <coughs> bundle on a Grassmannian and study chiral Durham complex, that's a fancy cohomology of uh, such combination, then claim is that it's completely symmetric with respect to N1, N2, and N3, and such symmetry is not manifest on the right-hand side. So sorry, that's, sorry. yeah. Can you go back to the triality? Picture? Yeah. So your evidence for this is Hoft anomaly matching? Uh, by, by now, all kinds of things, uh, not just various anomaly matchings. I'll talk more about anomalies a bit later. Uh, calculations of elliptic genera, various brain constructions, and uh, I'll, I'll get to this by engineering them from high dimensional theories in various ways. So uh, it's still a conjecture. I want to emphasize just like cyborg duality is actually a conjecture, but there is a lot of evidence, especially in 0-2 case. <coughs> I'll give much more provocative statements which are more fun conjectures that I, I, that I think are more, uh, more at risk. 
But I think then you'll have to catch the train, unfortunately, or fortunately. Uh, was there another question? Is this connected to an F equal 4 and F equal 2 and say 4 dimension? Um, Where you have also 3 And F equals, say again? Oh, uh, I don't know. That's a, that's a good question. I would lo yeah, explanation of this sort is something something very simple, which puts number three right at the forefront would be lovely. I, I don't think we have that, no. I'll present something more uglier than that, yeah. You haven't seen some connection to either topological vertex or yeah. to... I, I would love to. Again, I, I would love to. It's very suggestive. It's algebra in the corner? Yeah, so, something like that. Uh, VOA at the corner is just VOA, it's not a theory, so th this is physical theory. But I'll comment on 04 case, uh, where we also were expecting triality. Surprisingly, in 2D theory systems, triality will persist. So you'll see it over and over again. So again, it suggests that something geometric, like brain construction with three types of brains and you just rotate them, or something like this, or uh, triality in SO8 in fact, uh, would be responsible for this. We don't have this, so it, it begs for very simple intuitive explanation, even in this basic case. Um, right, so what I presented to you is a very nice large class of theories uh, which are labeled by number of colors and matter content, uh, which is uh, basic uh, SQCD theories, but they're not the most basic. So if you go to the boundary of this region, you can construct simpler theories. So let me try to redo this construction from scratch, starting over again. I pick a gauge group and simplest non-abelian gauge group, since I emphasize that non-abelian is something that uh, was lacking in the literature quite surprisingly. Uh, let's took us, take SU2 as a simplest non-abelian gauge group. So in general, if you pick a SUNC, it would have gauge anomaly minus uh, NC. So in this case, it would be minus two in my normalization. So to cancel that, you have to introduce some matter and the simplest matter, if you focus on fundamentals, uh, will be four copies, then they will cancel the gauge anomaly. And the simplest kind of Ising model of such theories would be therefore SU2 SQCD with four flavors. Conjecture is that it's dual to a theory with no gauge interactions whatsoever and uh, interactions of the landau ginzburg type where you have six chiral fields and one Fermi interacting via simple superpotential. So if you think about uh, such system and such duality, first question to ask uh, in terms of evidence is, for example, what is the, if I try to integrate out uh, gauge interactions, which are very strong in two dimensions. So as you go down our G flow, temptation is to write everything immediately in terms of gauge invariant operators. So here it would amount to asking, what is the space parameterized by scalar fields and the chiral multiplets mod out by gauge group? It's easy to see that it's a cone and the base of the cone is basically our space of matter fields divided by U2. So if I replace SU2 by U2, then such quotient is precisely the Grassmannian, namely 2,4 of two planes and four dimensional space. So then this Grassmannian can be also described by Pluca relation, which is a single relation. And this is nothing but the relation imposed by uh, this uh, superpotential. If again, you introduce additional U1, kind of think of gauging uh, U1 here making the group U2 and also gauging uh, six chirals always charge plus one, then you effectively make uh, six dimensional space divided by U1, which is CP5. And uh, this relation inside CP5 is yet another description of the same uh, base of the cone or, or uh, moduli space if you include U1. So is it phi 3, 4? Is it phi 1, 2, 1, 2? Is it phi 3, 4? Uh, yeah, probably there is a typo. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, it's 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 a Pluca relation for Grassmannian two four. Yes, so it should be different. It should be three four. Correct. Uh, right. So uh, by looking at such uh, simple things, you, for example, start seeing the evidence why a model with gauge interaction. So this is uh, trying to understand more and more basically what's going on. Uh, so this is kind of appetizer, if you wish, for much more interesting trialities. But in this case, it's a duality relating <coughs> such most basic SQCD with 0-2 supersymmetry to something still interacting, but very, very simple. Uh, essentially, landau ginzburg model or uh, no, Ising-type model. 
So another topic that Samson worked on a lot, and in fact that was al already alluded in some of our earlier discussion and questions, is uh, topological twists of high dimensional theories, in particular four dimensional theories. And um, when I was a kiddo, I really loved various TQFTs and topological twists. So to me, the issues, uh, that's how they refer to the paper, joint paper with uh, Nikita and uh, Andrei Losev, was basically a Bible to learn a lot of things, even including some of the cool things, uh, most recent that I'm gonna report on. So, <coughs> for the n equals one theories that I mentioned earlier, they do not admit topological twists on a general four-dimensional space-time. Uh, they exhibit interesting phase structure, something that uh, I already mentioned earlier in the sense of cyber dualities and so on but they can be topologically twisted on smaller manifolds. So we can try to do that. We can try to take not 4D n equals 2 theories, which produce Donaldson type twists, but 4D n equals 1 theories that, that have smaller supersymmetry. Uh, here I want to point out that this is analogous diagram to what I was showing you before. The phase structure of 0, 2 super QCD involves three numbers because we have two types of matter. In four dimensions, you have one basic type of matter, namely chiral multiplets. So it's easier to plot. It becomes just one dimensional line instead of two dimensional picture. And here are the landmarks involve uh, relative to number of colors, three half and C and, and C plus one. These are cool, interesting values where something happens. I'll come back to this in a second. So what you can do in 4D n equals 1 theories is to take one of the cyborg duals and try to topologically twist a theory on a Riemann surface, on a two-manifold. Supersymmetry is enough to do that. And in fact, this uh, kind of topological twist had been studied by Samson collaborators and Misha Bershatsky was actually around here. So uh, he, in famous work with um, Valodya Sadov and uh, Johansson and Kumran, uh, studied such compactifications now called partial topological twist, because you twist along partial uh, part of the space-time, not, not entirely spa full space-time. So if you do that, you, you get precisely uh, this relation to two-dimensional theories with either four super... Uh, uh, oh, sorry, uh, yes. Uh, if you do n equals two twist, you get four supercharges. Here I'm illustrating at four n equals one theories where you get uh, two real supercharges, namely 0, 2 supersymmetry. And if you start with dual pair in four dimensions, you might expect that you'll find a dual pair after compactification. This logic uh, has to be taken very carefully and seriously uh, and revisited because there could be many caveats, but I'll show you example where this literally works so you don't have to worry about any details. So, in this partial topological twist, uh, first question is what happens if I take my basic multiplets? A vector multiplet becomes a vector multiplet in two dimensions plus adjoint chirals related uh, in number to the genus of your surface. This is basic color to Klein reduction. There is nothing fancy here. And if you do the same for a chiral multiplet, you find that uh, because of the topological twist, the number of uh, effective either chiral or Fermi multiplets in two dimensions is affected by the R charge of the original chiral multiplet in four dimensions. With respect to vector multiplet, there is no such choice. In fact, you can study such compactifications on basic two manifolds, which are spheres. This is something that, again, uh, goes back to that early work uh, we mentioned of Samson with Nikita and Lossif, and more recently, younger guys like uh, Sergey there, the other Sergey, myself, and others worked on. So it's a fun color Klein reduction which connects different types of uh, 4D and 2D physics with similar gauge dynamics. In the present case, let's take this uh, simplest Cyberg pair, which actually has SU2 gauge group just like what we want in two dimensions, but we'll take a different matter content. We'll have n f equals three, and here we get n equals four. So it's actually fun to go through this and see how uh, this emerges. First of all, n f equals three really means six doublets in, in dimension four. That's the usual notation. But also I want to point out that with respect to n c equals two, n f equals three is uh, also uh, n c plus one, as well as 3 half NC. So it's a very special value where these two different landmarks actually coincide. And the theory is famously dual to just the theory of mesons, even in four dimensions. So it's very similar to what we were proposing in two dimensional case. But there is no 
there is no triality. So th this is, in that sense, it's a simpler model. It's, it's a basic appetizer, but unfortunately, it's, it's, it's not a triality. So it's, uh, in, in the more general class, question still remains, but, but here it, it's an example of how you get duality from duality. Yeah. And in my opinion, uh, triality is in some sense more mysterious, more interesting. This is something more traditional. That's why it connects to 4D theories that we also understand in a way that you guys also studied. So what happens here is that you have to choose our charge assignment to, to do this reduction. And the way number four comes out of this uh, six doublets is because to make an anomalous R charge assignment, you have to choose some charges and two of them have to be one. So as a result, uh, you get here SU2 with four flavors. And if you trace what happens on the dual side, you get exactly the spectrum and interactions as proposed before. <laughs> so that's in fact one evidence for, for this duality, if you wish. So this is one application where you can derive something two-dimensional from four-dimensional physics, from high-dimensional theories. Again, there is no such good understanding of trialities, at least. Uh, it, it, there, there are proposals and they shed light on the physics, but they're more cumbersome. And number three is not just glaring at you from the page. That's what you guys were suggesting and that's still lacking. I want to emphasize. Number three in this example. There is no number three. This is duality. That's not a triality. That's why it's a simpler thing, but in my opinion, it's a little bit more boring. So it's, it's, it's a, on a outside of that class. It's, uh, you can say it belongs to triality where one of the three corners of the triality degenerates to nothing, unfortunately. So is that this theory flows to nothing? No, 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 no. It's, uh, again, that's a figure. Okay, forget it. It's, I'll, I'll clarify. There are not that many trialities in four dimensions. That's why I was proposing. Exactly. That, that's why number three is, is mysterious. Yeah, so SOA triality, triality of some uh, three prong a uh, brain network or something is, is suggestive for, for candidate, but again, there has been nothing like this so far. Anyway, going backwards, we can try to learn something uh, both ways. Uh, so here I showed you how from high dimensions we learn about dualities in 2D system, but then we can also learn something about high dimensional systems from these dualities. In fact, if you can practify and understand this uh, reduction on Riemann surfaces and get good control over this 2D physics, which again is easy to do, I just showed you an example, you get a glimpse of what happens in a high dimensional theory when it's actually twisted on a general four manifold as long as you have your 4D n equals 1 theory flowing to 4D n equals 2 theory. You can get a lot of mileage by going backwards, by understanding uh, such twists, and this is especially useful if your theory is non-Lagrangian, because then it should still admit topological twist, but uh, it won't have a very simple description a la Donaldson type TQFT. It will be something more interesting and mysterious and question, in fact, already posed in that paper on issues uh, as well as testing cyber quit and solution was what happens with our Juris Douglas theories, which are simplest examples of non-Lagrangian 4D n equals 2 theories. So they should have topological twists and question what do they compute on a general form any form. We propose that we have to think about it as a point in a model. We should not think about that as a one particular cell or its own, but as a part inside right. the model at space. But that's a very delicate point. So question is indeed, what happens? What the answer? I don't know the answer, actually. I, nobody does on a general form manifold. But I can propose you an answer on a very simple manifold or class of manifolds of the form S1 cross a general 3 manifold. So in that case, you can think about this theory if you compactify on S1, but it's important that we're still working with four-dimensional theory. So you basically keep all the Kalutza Klein modes. That's important. As a three-dimensional TQFT on an M3. And then you can pose the question, okay, what is it as a 3D TQFT on M3? So claim is that it's described by usual axioms of three-dimensional TQFTs. In particular, you can associate modular tensor category, which has cutting and gluing relations described by S and T matrices. And uh, you can, for every Arjuris Douglas theory, you get a set of our, uh, this uh, S and T matrices that can be computed from the beta vacuum uh, vacuum. So this is particular, if you wish, development or application of gauge beta correspondence, uh, the way, in fact, uh, it was envisioned, lifted all the way to four dimensional n equals to business. So in the most basic Arjuris Douglas theory, 
uh, which sometimes in the literature is called 2,5, or Juris Douglas theory. That's the theory that our Juris and Douglas studied in great detail. What you find is so-called Fibonacci modular tensor category that describes Fibonacci anions. It has two simple objects, and S and T matrices are close cousin of what we see in Ising type MTC or uh, other simple modular tensor categories. Okay. Enough of 0, 2, let's talk a little bit about 0, 1. So this is where we have half of the supersymmetry, so we're cl quickly losing control. But uh, equations are recognizable in this case, or they are just... Mm -hmm. Samson is asking if beta equations are recognizable in this case. Um, Sometimes they are actually... Not quite, I, I don't know. We should, uh, I, sh I can show you uh, the equations and hopefully you'll tell me what the integrable system is. I don't know, that's, that's, uh, that's a very good question. Sorry, just short question. Are you actually solving this beta type system? Yes, yeah. So the, the matrices are obtained from data of some fixed points on moduli spaces or critical points of potential. And potential is uh, involves some elliptic function. So it could be an interesting integrable system, but again, I. I don't remember to answer Samson's question off the top of my head. So let's talk a little bit about 0, 1 super QCD. Again, going back to this motivation, how come our fathers uh, of the subject, such as Schwinger and uh, Tooft and others, didn't solve it for us? It's, it's such a simple theory. We have almost no supersymmetry and we're in two dimensions. So shouldn't this be done in, I don't know, 70s, 80s, or at least 90s? That's right, but 74, when Hooft's paper was written, that's exactly the year when supersymmetry came uh, to the shelves. So, um, yeah, it should have been done back in the 80s. So here, uh, Chris Hall, who is here, uh, and, and, and written, uh, again, classified supermultiplets, and they're actually less famous because somehow, at least these days, younger generation, uh, goes immediately to higher dimensions and maybe doesn't learn this too often. So therefore I decided to summarize them for you. They're complete analogs of this chiral multiplets and Fermi multiplets in 0-2 case, except that chiral multiplet does not deserve to be uh, called chiral in a sense of holomorphy, uh, because scalar here is a real scalar and fermions involved are Majorana while fermions. So they're uh, left moving or right moving depending on multiplet, but they're all real. So everything is real, you completely lose power of supersymmetry in a traditional sense. So if 0, 2 was some, somewhat useful, 0, 1 is uh, here very, very weak. So you have um, interactions in the form of superpotential, which again is a real superpotential, and vector multiplets. So let's do the same, let's uh, build the simplest QCD. So we take a uh, vector multiplet because now it has half of the gluinos of 0, 2 theory. Uh, the anomaly is half of MC with one sign, so you have to compensate it. And uh, previously we had NF equals 4 in 0, 2 notations. So here we're going to have NF equals 2 in 0, 2 notation. So here I'm assuming that uh, we take um, complex doublets and there are two of them. So. That's a natural way how SU2 can have complex representation. So again, anomalies cancel. Basic question is, what does this theory do in the deep infrared? So you kick it off, it goes via our G-flow, where do you end up? Does it confine? Is it a massive gapped phase or gapless phase? Interacting theory, what happens? Proposal is that uh, it flows to a free uh, multiplets, a free scalars, and uh, the logic could be obtained in a way similar to the previous uh, scenario. In fact, you can try to think of this uh, proposal that I'm going to give you as a soft perturbation of the previous duality that we studied. First of all, the moduli space, which we can analyze in a similar manner, is a quotient by the gauge group, which is SU2, of uh, matter fields, uh, scalars in the matter multiplets. And now there are uh, two complex uh, doublets, so it's a C2 turns or C2, some eight dimensional real space divided by SU2. And again, it looks like a cone. It's a cone whose base uh, is um, S7 divided by SU2. And this quotient is actually S4. It's a famous, uh, one of the famous Hopf vibrations. So the cone on a four sphere is R5. So that's part of the reason why we are proposing that this could be just R5 parametrized by real scalars. Again, very simple duality. Again, it's a duality. 
If you try to construct more interesting uh, theories with 0-1 supersymmetries, again you find surprisingly not a set of dualities. If you construct simpler 0-1 super QCD, again you find trialities. I have no idea where this, why this so happens in two dimensions that having just one gauge group and asking how does non-abelian gauge interactions in two dimensions exhibit dualities immediately leads you to number three. This is, this is very funny, very strange, very mysterious. In fact, something else happened, something we didn't quite resolve, and that connects to a uh, question Vasily was asking. So, <coughs> in the case of uh, two-dimensional theories with 0-2 supersymmetry, we were dealing with groups uh, SU n or SUNC. In the case of n equals 0-1 supersymmetry, which is even simpler, uh, what I'm showing you here is class of theories which exhibit this triality and behave very nicely, but natural thing to act on a real representation, on real repre matter fields and real representations is SO, because you don't have a complex structure. And then we were naturally expecting that if you uh, ask about 0-4 supersymmetry, which came up in Ruben's question as well as in Vasily's question, we were naturally expecting that you should have your SP, and in fact we were hoping to connect to um, um, there this uh, corner and other developments and somehow there is a check mark here and check mark here so I claim that there is another triality which is much more delicate uh, so this this is real conjecture in that sense you sure you're gonna make the train I'll leave after you <laughs> finish this yeah because th 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 this is more speculative so this is this is cool conjecture so this is conjecture to which Again, it's fresh of the oven. Until last year, there was nothing on zero-one theories or dualities with non-abelian gauge groups. There were no dual pairs. And again, claim is that they come in threes. So where the hell number three come from, I don't know. Moreover, this is kind of conjecture which is very risky. So I don't know if this is really true, but that's our conjecture and I'll give you some of the evidence. So it checks out, but this didn't work. So part of the reason this work was delayed for several years, we were hoping to get to other cases shortly after 02 in past five years or so. The reason it took so long is that this case didn't work out. We don't have any good set of non-abelian dualities analogous, so we were expecting trialities, but again, somehow they didn't work in the 04 case. So I present this as a challenge, and SP, uh, if, even if it appears, it actually is more relevant here somehow, no, not really in that case. So, I don't know, there are lots of questions. <coughs> so again, statement is that here you get that same triality, and uh, it's much more delicate. So here you cannot use the usual um, uh, techniques uh, from holomorphy and very simple anomalies. Uh, you actually have to think a lot about very delicate type of anomalies, which were behind the scene and checking every pro previous duality I mentioned. So that's part of the anomalies in the title and <coughs> in connection to our general subject. But here, these anomalies uh, appear in several flavors. First of all, there are simple perturbative tooth-like anomalies, which you can compute from one-loop diagrams. So th those are easy, those check out, and those I would call perturbative. But then there are also global, because they care about global structure of the gauge group, anomalies that have somewhat non-perturbative nature and uh, take values in this uh, torsion part of uh, Bordism group, spin Bordism group of classifying space of G, where G is your symmetry. So these are much more delicate anomalies, and this is kind of cool and interesting. For example, if you try to build the simplest example of a theory with 0-1 supersymmetry which exhibits these anomalies, you can take n scalar multiplets and just one Fermi multiplet which enforces via superpotential <coughs> this condition that all of your scalars square to some constant. So you're trying to describe a target space which is hard to see here, but which is a sphere of dimension n minus 1. So no gauge fields. But then, if you try to gauge Z2, which acts as antipodal map, so out of a two, uh, n dimensional sphere, you're trying to make RPN, basically, by gauging Z2, what you find is that uh, this anomaly is actually non trivial. And in fact, the group that's relevant here for Z2 happens to be Z8. And as a result, such theory only makes sense or is non anomalous when n is multiple of 8. So this is a uh, simplest example where such global or non-abelian, uh, sorry, non-perturbative anomaly happens. So 
I don't know, I, I mentioned previously that for understanding zero two theories, it was sometimes useful. In fact, that's how they came about in our first work with Putrov and Gada. We were trying to get them from various brain configurations and high dimensional theories. So zero one theories have very little supersymmetry, cannot easily get them from four dimensions uh, reducing on uh, Riemann surfaces. You can, but you have to be very inventive about how you do it. But they actually come very naturally on the boundary of 3D theories. So here is a paper which uh, intended to study uh, walls, lines, and all kinds of phenomena related to spectral dualities in 3D n equals 2 theories, and uh, was using gauge beta correspondence in a crucial way. So in this paper, we cite um, Samson's work uh, affluently. And uh, it's easily generalizable to 3D n equals 1 context, where on the boundary, you naturally get two-dimensional physics with 0, two, uh, zero 1 supersymmetry. So we can try to ask which three-dimensional systems can give us some of the proposed 0, 1, two-dimensional super QCD-like theories. So these are usual truth-like anomalies that you get from various building blocks, three-dimensional matter, two-dimensional matter. Again, you want to make sure that they cancel as far as gauge interactions are concerned. And um, here is an example. You can take a 3D n equals 1 system with um, just SUN vector multiplet. Again, it's going to be minimal supersymmetry in three dimensions. At Chern Simons level n over 2, it's believed to have one uh, vacuum, one massive vacuum. So the theory uh, flows to supersymmetric <coughs> vacuum. And with choosing Neumann boundary conditions on both sides for this gauge multiplet, you basically get <coughs> uh, different anomaly inflow on boundaries. Chern Simons level causes the fact that on one boundary it contributes with a plus sign, on the other boundary with minus sign. So on one boundary you don't have to do anything, the inflow is trivial, but on the other boundary you have to compensate it with something, and because we're imposing Neumann boundary conditions, we get SUN interactions, <coughs> and simply spell to compensate it is to add n fundamental flavors. That's precisely the duality or the system that I was proposing, and system in a bulk flows to one gapped vacuum, so you would expect that in the deep infrared it's described by gauge invariant quantities, so that's this uh, five scalars when n equals to two. But uh, then there are more interesting inventive ways to engineer it, in fact, somewhat more natural. Um, more natural way would be, in fact, to take 3D n equals 1 theory uh, with SUNC gauge group and the same number of fundamental flavors. So it's also supposed to engineer on boundaries in the same way, but now in a non-trivial way, because both boundaries would contribute um, the uh, dynamics uh, of 0, 1 theory of the type that I showed you before, and therefore the dynamics of zero one theories makes a prediction that first of all, uh, this theory does not break supersymmetry dynamically and suggests that it should have a dual. But uh, as far as I know, the dual of this 3D n equals one system is not known. So that's one of the questions. I promised you several questions. So that's one of the questions I want to leave with you. And finally, I promise new dualities. As you can see in the world of uh, supersymmetric dynamics uh, or gauge dynamics, we're getting into more and more delicate effects. So I'll finish with the most uh, delicate uh, type of anomalies, if you wish, uh, that don't have interpretation, even in terms of this discrete global anomalies that I showed you a moment ago. So actually, in two yeah. dimensions, in two dimensions, you don't, you don't have to cancel the or you don't have to introduce that fermion. There are also Bezumina, Chiron, so on. So there are many ways in two dimensions. You use the fact that the, you had the first necessary, you introduce the left hand fermions, which had the same anomaly and so on. But equally, you could have coupled it chirally to WZW mode. That, that's true, but yeah, so you have to that's keep track of anomaly one way or the other. That's right. There are many mechanisms, but I right. think you could see. The other one probably is harder to supersymmetrize. Yeah, so I, I totally agree. And uh, wh what I was showing on this previous slides is that there are several ways to engineer the same system. And some of them may be uh, relating to questions that we don't know about, in, in this case, in high dimensions. That's still of same general spirit of trying to get 2D theories from high D. Uh, right, so in this last part, let, let me uh, ask about the topology of this theory space. So this is space where uh, every theory is represented by a point, or G flow is represented by a flow line, very much like in dynamical systems. And you try to connect all possible theories 
uh, going from one critical point to another and uh, so on. Ask, ask what this topology looks like. So, in fact, studying the zero-one theories in a joint work with Dupé, Pavel Putrov and Kumran, uh, we had to make a conjecture in order to make peace with many facts from physics and math. So we had to conjecture that this space of theories, which I call T, uh, has the following property. First of all, the space is graded by uh, gravitational anomaly. This is kind of obvious because, uh, well, first of all, gravitational anomaly is one of the most obvious things in uh, 2D uh, superconformal theories. Uh, it's, it's difference of left and right central charge. And clearly, uh, by any RG flow, you can never go from one value of this number n, which is the difference, uh, to another value. So uh, this theory space is clearly consists of islands, uh, which are different connected components labeled by different n. But then we further had to conjecture that each graded component has a funny property, that if you ask about its homotopy types, then shifting this index of pi by k is the same as shifting this value. So that's kind of strange. That's a very interesting thing. Uh, it, it's a rather non-trivial conjecture. Again, I don't know if it's true or not. I'm going and increasing complexity of conjectures and, and my risk of failing them, therefore um, losing credibility. But th this is what we were led to conclude. And the reason this is funny is because it says that apart from gravitational anomaly, which distinguishes different connected components, in the theory space, there, is, there are some other kinds of anomalies because uh, these groups, uh, now if you again compute them and so on, uh, they have torsion, a lot of torsion, and torsion doesn't come just in multiples of two. So you don't get just uh, Z2, Z8, Z16, which we often get from fermion anomalies. You start getting multiple of three appearing. And I told you that in this talk, all my mysteries will be related to number three. So here, one of the mysteries is why three, or how Z3 appears as a home for anomaly. And we see it not from complicated cobordism groups, but rather we can see it immediately run right in front of us. So here uh, is the first example, Z24, but there are lots of Z3s that appear further down the road, and five or seven never appear, so it's only two or three. For two, origin is usually typically very simple, as it has origin in fermions, but again, three is, is something mysterious. So here is an illustration of what this type of anomalies, new anomalies that I don't know how to interpret. And they're again, not of the type that I showed you before, that they cannot be, as far as I know, expressed in terms of cobordism groups or generalized higher form symmetries. Again, maybe they can, but it hasn't happened yet. Um, so again, yeah, so you understand, you can move between the TNs by tacking a free Fermi multiple, right? Yes. So how can they be fundamentally different? You just tack a free Fermi multiple. Yeah, so th th this gives a lot of information about um, uh, structure of each of them, basically. That, that, that's right. So they're all very similar. I would say they're isomorphic. Yeah. But, but uh, th so th I can explain what, what, what this means. So this implies a lot of relation on each individual copy. They're isomorphic, but if you take, say, well, abstractly one of them, it, it's a huge infinite dimensional space. And what this gives is humongous information uh, it, it's a very constrained system, precisely because of this relation of what pi k of a given fixed guy is. So you immediately know the whole tower, basically. Shift the stars to exactly, to zero yes, and exactly. The, 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 this is, uh, uh, such spaces are extremely rare. And, and this is what's called a uh, structure of infinity spectrum and amigo spectrum. And, and th there are very extremely rare things. So that's why I'm saying this conjecture is, is uh, something much stronger than even zero one triality that I mentioned. So the way to think about it is as follows. So if I say that there are different components labeled by gravitational anomaly, what these different additional things tell us is that each one of them may have basically subdivisions. So uh, here is an illustration of thinking about them that this one gets divided into two parts, uh, some numbered parts and so on and so forth. So they're basically different, m way more connected components than, than you thought they could be. So again, I don't have a good explanation of this type of anomalies that play a role in the zero-one theories. Uh, this is, seems to be a con consistent network, or as Nadia Seiberg would say, web of statements uh, or conjectures. But um, 
they, this definitely require, uh, are, are required by uh, some of the dualities and zero-one theories that I mentioned earlier. So some of them have natural interpretation, but in, in very low uh, rank. Um, for example, this is basically refinement of Witten index, where you look at kernel of supercharge uh, or the same thing in one of the fermion numbers. You still have uh, supercharge on the right in zero one system, so you can analyze that. And mod two index uh, is is candidate uh, or or is uh, it's, it's not much of a conjecture. This is really true, but again, I don't have an explanation for the entire tower. So this is. In that sense, it's showing that it's something delicate, something rather subtle. So therefore, I leave you with this question. And uh, again, happy, very happy birthday, Samsung. Maybe a few questions, and uh, other questions we'll do at the dinner. And the cake. Did you talk to some topologists like Mike Hobbs, who we can recognize the spectrum? Yes, I, uh, so the, this last part, uh, which uh, I presented in a very short way, in fact, is highly motivated by theory of topological modular forms. And uh, yeah, we, we uh, exactly, yeah. So we, we, we did talk to Mike as well as Peter Teichner at MPI. So we're using those resources heavily. Uh, What's about five? Like I said, I don't know. I, to me, appearance of number three in two-dimensional physics was a big surprise. Five does not appear, seven does not appear, no other prime number appears. So big challenge is to explain any of the threes, that, that, that either in form of anomalies or in form of trialities or otherwise. All right, let's uh, finish this session. Thank you.